skeptics and pros. And uh, it's thrilling for me uh, to see old friends here, literally from every phase of my life, uh, going back to Kansas City, uh, uh, and, and certainly uh, at law school, the vineyard, my time in Washington, D.C. So it's great to see all of you. Uh, my book is about the puzzling nature of Jewish identity and the challenges facing the American Jewish community. In my few minutes this afternoon, let me share a couple personal stories that are in my book and that illustrate that the notions of identity and being Jewish are slippery terms. The first story involves a relationship I had with one of the most influential theorists on the subject of identity, Eric Erickson. I first met Erickson in 1975. <clears throat> At the time, uh, he had recently retired as a Harvard professor and with his wife Joan had moved to Tiburon, California. I was fortunate enough to be invited to join a small interdisciplinary group of about 12 professionals who met with Erickson on a monthly basis for six or eight months. Now most of the members of this seminar were prominent Bay Area mental health professionals, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, and psychologists who were considerably older than I was. I was in my 30s, a law professor at Berkeley with interdisciplinary interests, and at the time my interests were focused particularly on issues of child custody and children in the law. I leapt at the opportunity to, to join this distinguished group and to learn more about identity and human development from Erickson. Now, when I was a student at Harvard College, Erickson was a professor. But I have to confess, in the 60s when I was in college, uh, I never took a course from him. He was certainly a faculty celebrity, and uh, many of my friends took his course. He had been trained in Vienna as a child psychoanalyst by the Freuds themselves, primarily Anna, uh, but also he had some connection with Sigmund Freud. Erickson was a professor of human development and a lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard, and his perpetually oversubscribed undergraduate course at Harvard, Social Sciences 139, The Human Life Cycle, was popular and known for being extremely interesting, great fun, and not terribly demanding. Uh, now, Erickson's worldwide influence sprang from his developmental model of identity, which posited that we work through particular challenges over eight life stages. Freud's original theory of development had not extended past the, early years, the years of early childhood. Erickson had coined the concept of an identity crisis, which related to an adolescent's struggle to develop a strong and a cohesive sense of self. Erickson also championed the idea that a person's cultural context influenced her identity development. He had written best-selling biographies of Martin Luther and Gandhi, and really had helped establish a genre of what's sometimes called psychobiography. Indeed, he won uh, the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award for his book, Gandhi's Truth. Now, I cannot claim to have gotten to know Erickson very well over the course of these faculty seminars, but Dale and I were fortunate enough to be invited to a small dinner party with him during this process. A at 72, it sort of horrifies me to think that <laughs> I'm older than he was then, uh, uh, he was a handsome man with blue eyes, a light, ruddyish complexion, and he had a striking mane of beautiful white hair. Although courtly, he dressed very informally. In fact, like my grandfather, George Sittenfeld, he wore a western string tie with a striking piece of jewelry as a clasp. He was soft-spoken, and he spoke with an accent. From his name and appearance, I assumed he was Scandinavian. Dale and I had been invited to a dinner party uh, which the Ericsons attended, and Dale was seated next to Erickson. And early in the evening, he asked her what kind of name Manukin was. When she told him that the name came from a Hebrew word meaning at rest or peaceful, he looked at Dale and asked whether she was Jewish. When she replied she was, he said, you don't look Jewish. <laughs> then, as if to explain his questions, he said with apparent modesty, I write about identity, you know. Well, what neither of us knew at the time was the importance to Erickson himself, what he attached to not looking Jewish, 
and not having a Jewish name. We found that out by chance shortly after this dinner party when Erickson suffered a crisis relating to his own complicated and confused identity. The crisis was triggered by a New York Times book review with the provocative title, Eric Erickson, The Man Who Invented Himself. This front page story in the March 30th, 1975 Sunday book review included a beautiful photograph of Erickson with, all, with his beautiful hair. And it was written by Marshall Berman, a city college professor uh, with a Harvard PhD who had studied with Erickson. The review was of Erickson's most recent book, Life History and the Historical Moment, a collection of essays. The first paragraph of the review gave no hint of what was to come, and it couldn't have been more complimentary. He characterized Erickson as, as close to being an intellectual hero as American culture had. He talked about life cycle identity crisis, inner space, psychohistory, various concepts that he had championed. Uh, <clears throat> but several paragraphs later, Berman realized what for me was a complete surprise. He wrote, like many of the outstanding intellectuals of our time, Erickson grew up as a Jew in Imperial and Weimar Germany and crossed the water to America during the Hitler years to fulfill a vital inner need. Berman argued that Erickson's vital need was to abandon his Jewish and German refugee status and reinvent himself as a man of Danish Gentile ancestry. Berman's harshest criticisms focused on what Erickson had admit, uh, omitted from his autobiographical essay. Uh, <clears throat> he had acknowledged that his stepfather, whose name was Hamburger, uh, had been Jewish, but he had not acknowledged that his mother had been Jewish as well, and that in fact, he had been raised as a Jew and had been bar mitzvahed. As evidence of Erickson's bad faith, Berman mentioned a number of things, including the things I just said. Uh, and he also pointed to the fact that Erickson had changed his surname as an adult after having grown up with Hamburger's name and having been raised in his household. This name change, according to Berman, represented Erickson's repudiation of his stepfather, whose Jewish name he should normally bear, although he kept his stepfather in the background as a vestigial H. It's Eric H. Erickson. Uh, he also said that the new surname, Erickson, had been chosen and was not his birth father. Erickson never knew who his birth father was, but rather a name he'd made up, drawing on his own first name. Berman noted, quote, the cosmic chutzpah of his claim to be Eric Erickson, his own father, in the most literal sense of a self-made man. <clears throat> He also said Erickson really didn't admit that he'd been a refugee, uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, by refusing to confront himself as a Jew, Erickson represses at least one experience of dreadful suffering we know he went through. He was a victim of Nazism. Uh, <clears throat> Erickson had asserted that he came to America voluntarily, and Berman said he didn't come voluntarily. He came as a Jew who had to get out. I'm not sure that's actually accurate because he came rather early. Uh, the review did more than accuse Erickson of dishonesty about his Jewish heritage. It suggested that in invading or denying his Jewishness, Erickson was inauthentic and had lived his life inconsistently with his own developmental theories, which emphasized wholeness, a concept that according to Berman means, quote, we should strive to accept our pasts, our parents, our diverse and disparate impulses and needs and yearnings instead of rejecting and repressing the parts of ourselves we fear. Now, shortly after the review appeared, the seminar met for what I think was the last time. Erickson himself was not present. I suspect he was embarrassed and shaken by the review. His biographer, uh, and it's a very good biography by Lawrence Friedman uh, called Identity's Architect, suggests that the review had been a very upsetting blow. Uh, to the rest of us in this faculty seminar, many of whom were Jewish, uh, we were stunned by the intensity of Berman's attack, and we talked about what, if anything, we should do. None of us really knew all the facts of his biography. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, none of us uh, ended up, although we talked about it, uh, formally protesting to the Times, in part because we didn't know exactly how much was accurate and how much wasn't. What we in the seminar did not discuss 
were the issues relating to Jewish identity that rose, at least for me, from Berman's review. Berman seemed to assume that the way to determine whether someone was Jewish was to apply the matrilineal principle of Jewish law. Erickson's mother was Jewish, therefore Erickson was Jewish. But did that mean he had to be forever Jewish? Was his biological father's background of no relevance? Was Erickson not allowed to forge his own identity? Moreover, I wondered, had Erickson converted to Christianity? And if so, to what extent should this be relevant? Like the others in the group, I was unwilling to criticize Erickson. I wished I had more facts, and in the book, I really dug in to get more facts. And my guess was that Erickson himself no longer thought of himself as Jewish, and because of anti-Semitism was reluctant to be identified publicly as a Jew. But no one in our group posed the most troubling question raised by the Berman Review. Was this man we liked and admired, this man dedicated to identity and wholeness, a self-hating Jew? I was raised to believe it was wrong to try to pass as a Gentile. But when I think about Erickson, I wonder, is it always wrong? What if a person feels no connection to Judaism as a religion or to the Jewish community? What if the burdens of anti-Semitism become unbearable, as they may have been for Erickson growing up in Europe? Why should it be wrong to stop identifying yourself to others as Jewish under such circumstances? In other words, why shouldn't you be allowed to opt out? Questions like these lead me now, some 40 years after my encounter with Erickson, to study in more detail his story and the various strands of his identity and to think a lot more about my own identity in grappling with the issue of what does it mean to be Jewish? Uh, by untangling Erickson's story and to some degree my own, I hope to reveal the complex questions of identity arise when we consider the many different ways in which someone might be said to be Jewish or not. And in so doing, I wish to expose the unsatisfying way in which American Jews today often categorize or pigeonhole each other as either Jewish or not. <clears throat> the second story I want to tell is even a more personal story, but it also relates to Jewish identity. And it concerns a family dinner table conversation Dale and I had with our two daughters, Allison and Jennifer, in Oxford, England. I was there on my first sabbatical. Uh, and uh, we had enrolled our two daughters, Jennifer then 11 and Allison 8, in English schools. Over dinner one night at the start of the school year, Jennifer told us about her new class, Religious Education, taught by Miss Kay, the formidable headmistress. Jennifer reported that Miss Kay began the class by asking, who here is of the Anglican faith? Jennifer reported that nearly all the girls raised their hands. Miss Kay then asked, who is Presbyterian? A couple more, Catholic, even Baptist. A few more hands that went up with each. Finally, Miss Kay turned to the class and asked, is anyone here not of the Christian faith? I asked Jennifer what happened next. Well, I raised my hand and Miss Kay said, and what are you, my dear? And I told her, I'm Jewish. Miss Kay paused for a second and then said, oh, how interesting. <laughs> then she asked whether my parents would object if as part of this course, we read portions of the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And Jennifer said she told them that we wouldn't object, that we let her read anything she wanted. <clears throat> Dale and I told Jennifer that she had responded quite appropriately. And trying to be psychologically sensitive, I said to Jennifer, well, how did you feel about all this? <laughs> Jennifer looked hard at Dale and me and asked, when are we going to become Jewish? <laughs> Dale and I were a little stunned. I responded slightly defensively, your mother and I have always thought of ourselves as Jewish. We're not really religious, but we are Jewish. Implicit in Jennifer's challenge was, what does it mean to be Jewish? Who should count as a Jew? Left unsaid, but implicit in my response was the idea I had grown up with. Being Jewish was not something you needed to choose to become. You just were, whether you liked it or not. By birth, Dale and I were Jews, therefore so was Jennifer. Descent was enough. Now, one thesis of my book is that for my grandchildren's generation, I do not think in America this will any longer be true. Now, to her credit at the time, Jennifer was not satisfied with my response. And she shot back, you know what I mean. And I said, I'm not sure I do. 
And she responded, I want to have a bat mitzvah. Dale and I looked at each other, baffled. Where had this idea come from? Not from us. Neither Dale nor I had ever been bar or bat mitzvah. We had grown up in the Midwest in the 1950s in highly assimilated families. Our parents and grandparents were longtime members of Reformed Jewish congregation, which in the Midwest at the time did not celebrate bar or bat mitzvahs. No Hebrew school for us. Instead, like our Protestant friends, we had been sent to Sunday school at our temple until 10th grade when we were confirmed. Twice a year, our parents took us to services on the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We received presents for both Hanukkah and Christmas. The latter celebrated as a secular holiday with gifts under a Christmas tree. To that point in our children's lives, we had done even less in terms of providing a religious education. We had not bothered to join any congregation, even after the children were born. Neither of us had felt any urge to become observant, and unlike the Midwest during the 1950s, we felt no community pressure to join a synagogue or temple. There's a wonderful book written in the 50s called Protestant, Catholic, and Jew by Will Herberg that makes the argument, which I think was true then, that in religion, religion in America was no longer so much a matter of truth, but you had to join one of the three teams. And I can assure you that in the Midwest, it's true, I knew no one growing up in Kansas City whose parents didn't belong to some kind of temple, synagogue, or church. There was not an option of sort of being what Pew says is the fastest growing group in America, the nuns, N-O-N-E. Now, one of the four challenges facing the American Jewish community is that for many American Jews, our commitment to Judaism as a religion is thin. Indeed, I discovered that this is one of the challenges, and we were an example of it. Uh, with the exception of the Orthodox, the data is overwhelmingly clear. We American Jews are less observant than our Christian neighbors, at least as measured by attendance at religious services or membership in a church or synagogue. <clears throat> Only a third of, American, of, of self-professed Jews belong to a temple or a synagogue. Uh, many Jews are not believers. Nearly half of Pew's respondents say they are agnostic or do not believe in God at all. 22% of those who identify as Jewish also reported that they have no religion, what Pew called Jews without Judaism. The figure balloons, uh, balloons to about 32% among millennials. Anyway, this is one big challenge for the American community. Uh, and that is we are not very committed to the religion qua religion in terms of belief or observances. Uh, let me illustrate a second challenge, and this is also personal. Uh, our younger daughter, Allison, married Corey Alcott. Corey Alcott's name on his birth certificate is Cornelius Alcott V. <laughs> Needless to say, Corey was not raised in a Jewish household. <laughs> This, was, this marriage was with our enthusiastic blessing, our daughter Allison. Uh, we never told either of our girls whom they could date or couldn't date. Uh, and uh, uh, Corey and his family were also entirely comfortable with Corey marrying someone who was Jewish. Uh, <clears throat> today, among Jews in America, intermarriage is the norm, not the exception. The, st the statistics are incredible. Since the year 2000, 57% of American Jews who married wed non-Jews. This represents a stunning change. As you know, traditional Jewish law prohibited intermarriage. Indeed, among observant Jews, uh, in the old days at least, they would sit shiva, that is say the prayer for the dead for someone who married outside the faith. In my grandparents' generation, intermarriage for Jews was exceedingly rare. The estimates are that it was about 2% in the first decade of the 20th century, 2% intermarriage rate. Uh, there's been steady and now explosive growth. In my parents' generation, intermarriage was unusual. In my generation, it was becoming more and more common, but was still the exception. For our children, even more now, as I say, intermarriage is the norm. Among non-Orthodox American Jews, and only 10% are Orthodox, the most recent survey suggests 70% intermarry. <clears throat> For Orthodox Jews, the intermarriage rate remains infinitesimal, very, very low. Now, many Jews believe intermarriage is the greatest threat to American Jewish continuity and survival. Until recently, Jewish American leaders, 
including nearly all rabbis, focus discussion on how to prevent or discourage intermarriage. I disagree with this approach. While this approach may work to inhibit orthodox use, and I certainly think parents should be free to urge their children to marry anyone they want, uh, I mean, or to marry as the parents might prefer, not that they're gonna follow the parents' advice. As a general strategy, I think it's crazy to think that as a matter of policy, we're gonna be able to diminish the rate of intermarriage. I, I, think, I think it's doomed to fail. Why? Because we represent 2% of the American population, and <clears throat> nowhere in the diaspora have Jews ever been so well integrated into a society as in America today. And so I just think it's not gonna happen because uh, uh, people are gonna find they have a great deal in common with others who may not, in fact, share their religious heritage. Moreover, I think often it's counterproductive. Uh, and many millennials are so uncomfortable with this notion that they really view it as bordering on racist. I don't personally think that, but I, I just wanna say that. If you talk to most young people about this, uh, 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 they don't go for it. Now, <clears throat> I think the challenge is how best to welcome and integrate these families into the Jewish community, and more importantly, how to nurture a Jewish identity in their children. Uh, in the reform movement today, and the Reconstructionist movement as well, I'm happy to report that intermarriage is now approached in a much more sympathetic way, and there's a little bit of movement among conservatives too. And I think there are reasons to be optimistic. A recent study in the Boston area showed that over 60% of the children of mixed marriages were being raised as Jews, typically with the encouragement and support of the non-Jewish parent. Our son-in-law, Corey, is a perfect example of it. He goes with the family uh, to high holy day services. He's not converting. And most, very few intermarried couples, not some do, uh, involve the spouse uh, intermarrying. Um, let me say, uh, by concluding, a few words about <clears throat> the third challenge, uh, and, and that is um, uh, Israel. Uh, the 2013 Pew Report suggests that caring about Israel is an element of most, what most American Jews think being Jewish means. Support for Israel and a commitment to its survival has long contributed to American Jewish identity, American Jewish identity. Uh, and it was once thought that pride in and support for the state of Israel would serve to unite a, a diverse American Jewish community and buttress Jewish identity in this country. Today, I fear the opposite is becoming true. Certain, in my view, present-day policies of the Israeli government now fuel intense conflicts among uh, American Jews and reinforce deep divisions within the American Jewish community. Many rabbis are reluctant to give sermons touching on Israel because they know their congregations are quite divided and it's, it, it's kind of can be a little bit like the third rail. Now I think at issue are two aspects of Israeli governmental policy uh, that I find deeply troubling. First, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the continued military occupation of the West Bank. And second, the exclusive role of the Orthodox rabbinate in defining for Israel what is authentic Judaism. Both are political issues and illustrate what I see as Israel's core challenge, and that is managing the tension, and it's a tension, between being Jewish and democratic in the face of serious security concerns. Uh, I, for one, am deeply committed to Israel's survival as a Jewish and democratic state, but I'm deeply troubled uh, by uh, many of the policies, and I'm also deeply troubled by a tendency in the American Jewish community to try to shut down the voices of Jewish people who are critical of Israeli policies. My book launch at Harvard Law School, <clears throat> I did as a benefit to J Street, so you'll see where my politics are. <laughs> and, uh, there were three young people there, uh, one a Harvard undergraduate, one uh, a Harvard Law School student, and a third a young professional. And all had been involved with what's called J Street EDU, which is the campus wing of J Street. And J Street is very supportive of a two-state resolution. 
Uh, it does not support BDS, I say as, as a footnote. Part of the program was I uh, interviewed them. And I asked them all what their experiences had been on campus with anti-Semitism. Because we all read about anti-Semitism on American campuses. And I don't want to say none exists. All three of them said they had experienced none. But what they had experienced was being personally attacked by other young Jews who were very fervent Zionists who said they were self-hating, self-defeating Jews. It was shocking. It was really shocking. Moreover, I, I describe this in the book, there are Hillel's in the country where, in fact, not the organizers of Hillel, but the student boards have not wanted J Street EDU to be under the Hillel umbrella. Anyhow, uh, the book, this book, I hope you read it, is grounded in my struggle to come to terms with my own Jewish identity, and it does propose a new way of thinking about who counts as Jewish. Uh, it emphasizes individual choice in two directions. It accepts as part of the American Jewish community, the community at large, anybody who wishes to identify, no matter how many Jewish parents they have. Uh, it, it also allows, and it, it also does not require formal religious conversion. I call this a big tent approach. I recognize that it violates centuries of Jewish tradition, but I think it meets critical contemporary needs and offers a sound basis for Jewish identity in America. Anybody who wants to publicly identify themselves as part of our Jewish enterprise, welcome. That's the Manukin standard. That's for the big tent. Now, under the big tent, uh, it's a two-pronged standard. There are all kinds of institutions, some religious, some philanthropic, some having to do with museums and film societies, Jewish community centers. One extraordinarily wonderful thing about the American Jewish community is the variety of institutions. My view is that any of these institutions can set any standard they want. If an Orthodox synagogue wants to have traditional halakhic standards, that's their absolute right to do so. But I don't want them imposing it on the community as a whole. Uh, because I think, in fact, in the long run, in America, it would be quite uh, counterproductive. As I said, I see the American Jewish community as a big tent and one I hope has open flaps. Under the big tent, a remarkable variety of activities. And inside the tent, the table is set with a smorgasbord of Jewish values, music, food, traditions, rituals, spirituality, language, philanthropic causes, connections with Israel. At this table, some will nibble, others will feast, but all will have options and none will be turned away. Once under the big tent, of course, Jews should be encouraged to stay, to affirm their identity rather than lapsing into apathy. And indeed, I think each of us has to answer the question, why do we care about being Jewish? And each of us must take responsibility for educating ourselves about our heritage and then choosing what's meaningful to us and how we want to express it. In a very real sense, I think the chosen people must become a choosing people. Thank you very much. I'd be glad to take questions, criticisms, comments, whatever. But I have a question. Can you go either the mic over there or the mic over there? No, it's not a matter of what No, they, they want, they're recording it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. You haven't mentioned anti-Semitism. Um, that has been one of the things that has kept Jews together for a couple thousand years. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first sentence. Anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. What's the effect on that? I'm about your age. Yes. And in my parents' generation, the people who grew up during the Depression and World War II, when there was overt anti-Semitism in this country, uh, there were, these were all second generation people who really didn't want to be Jewish. Uh, they joined, um, I forget what it's called, you know, the church that everybody can go to, Unitarian, um, or ethical culture, or something else. Um, as they got into their 70s and 80s, some of them started coming back. Um, but we still have anti-Semitism here. I think people who think we don't are crazy. And if they thought they, there were, Trump has proved otherwise. 
Uh, listen, you raise a very interesting point, and indeed, I uh, uh, described. Uh, uh, I didn't describe the fourth, what I see as the fourth challenge, mm -hmm. and the fourth challenge is. And I, I suspect you're going to disagree with me, but in part at least, is I think part of what helped keep the tribe together over time was anti-Semitism. Exactly. And, I, and during my lifetime in America, there has been the most extraordinary diminution of the relevance of anti-Semitism to the actual lives Jews are leading. True. Uh, I, I went to a boys' school in Kansas City that had a quota. Uh, when I went to law school, with one or two exceptions, there'd never been a Jewish dean. There certainly hadn't been Jewish presidents of the major universities. Right. There were uh, uh, industrial sectors where Jews couldn't get jobs. Right. My grandfather in 1924 bought a house in what was called the Country Club District through a straw because it was restricted. Okay, All of that's gone by the boards. I am not saying... Uh, that there aren't anti-Semites in America. I mean, Pittsburgh shows that there are. And I'm not saying that pe most Americans know uh, what we would characterize as anti-Semitic stereotypes about Jews in the same way that we know all kinds of stereotypes about blacks, women, and other groups. I mean, but on the other hand, I really believe, <clears throat> knock on wood, that for my grandchildren's generation, and for young people today, it's not particularly relevant to their lives. And I agree with you that that was part of the glue. And indeed, what's remarkable, I mean, again, it goes back a long ways, is you, in, in terms of the Jewish religious tr tradition, that we've always been at risk and there have been groups that hated us as part of almost the self-definition. Right. Now, uh, there's still places in the world where you can look where you can reaffirm it. But I guess my own feeling is, and I try to rather carefully analyze it in the book, I think in America the changes are so substantial that that's not going to present much of a force uh, to hold the tribe together in the future. I hope you're right. And I, I hope I am too, and I may not be right, I mean, because it's a prediction. <clears throat> I, uh, I also attended a uh, lecture by Eric Erickson back in the day, uh -huh. Harvard, and uh, and uh, well, I can tell you that uh, you described him very well, and uh, my jaw dropped when I read your chapter on him. So that's as I wasn't aware of, uh, of what that was. Uh, my question is, uh, Manny Round, uh, intermarriage, uh, mentioned that 58% uh, of the millennials uh, as a group uh, intermarry, and if you ex eliminate the Orthodox at 72%, uh, but the thing is, a group of uh, people of the non-Jewish spouse, there's no discussion uh, of whether or not that non-Jewish spouse converted or didn't convert. And I think it's it's important information to have to try to evaluate. Less what than five percent convert. It's exceedingly rare. Some do convert. Don't don't get me wrong. It's rare. Well, has and a much more common pattern that's very interesting, if you go to reform uh, 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 synagogues uh, and reconstructionist synagogues around the country, there are active participants of spouses who have never religiously converted, who participate very fully in congregational life. But uh, as I say, most, uh, I th look at, I think it's great if they want to convert, uh, and obviously, I, the rabbis willing to do the rabbis was that true in previous decades? Well, previous decades. It, it, look, e even today, uh, with maybe certain exceptions, uh, if the, the tradition of an Orthodox conversion is you say no to them three times. <laughs> I mean, it's and, and the requirement usually is you spend a period of months or years observing very strictly the mandates of Jewish law, including keeping kosher, celebrating Shabbat, all the stuff that most American Jews don't do. But if you want to get in the club, you got to do it. And uh, I mean, wh what's very peculiar about membership in the American Jewish world, it, it, it's like a, uh, 
Oh, this is I'm, uh, I'll I'll say it anyway. It's a a, a metaphor. Uh, uh, it's like a a yacht club, where if you're a legacy, you not only don't have to know how to sail or row or have a boat, but you're a member. But if you're not a legacy, you know you've got to prove you're the equivalent of a a, a world class Olympian sailor. And, and it, uh, I, I think there's this incredible asymmetry, which I think um, that's why I, I, I kind of struggled. I, this two-pronged test of mine, you know, with the big tent, you know, I, I know it's not uh, <clears throat> the, the Times in the review uh, characterizes it as revolutionary and, quote, perhaps heretical. And it pleased me to think I might be the first Jewish heretic since Spinoza. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Professor Manukin. Josh Braha, Rabbi at Temple Micah. We take seekers and heretics of all kind at Temple Micah. Right. Tell your children. Good for you. Uh, my question for you is, how has your relationship to Judaism, the religion, changed since writing this book? And I'm particularly curious, uh, um, you, since you mentioned uh, expressions of Judaism, if, if since writing this book, you, and, and I'm asking personally, um, how, what's, what's different now? And uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Well, uh, <clears throat> That's a perfectly fair question. Uh, we now belong to a congregation, the Martha's Vineyard Hebrew Center. Uh, we do not, we don't go, we, the, the, the Martha's Vineyard Hebrew Center has a summer program where they have speakers come in and we're very involved in that and love that and I love the rabbi. Uh, we don't, and I, I go to Hillel services I don't teach on the High Holy Days because I think it'd be a bad example. Uh, and I usually do something, but I'm, I, I remain not very observant. And what I really regret, and I, I say this in the book, I wish I felt more of an emotional connection uh, with the liturgy and the religious dimensions because I am absolutely of the view as a mechanism for transmission uh, uh, people who have religious commitments have an easier task of it. Uh, in the book, I, end up, I ended up uh, asking myself uh, if my grandson, believe it or not, Cornelius Alcott the Sixth, <laughs> asks me, well, uh, uh, what's it mean to you? Why are you Jewish? What's it mean to you? I mean, I haven't, I now, I've worked through, I have an answer. I have an answer. And um, I, I, uh, I boil it down by saying uh, the Jewish head, the Jewish heart, and the Jewish heritage. And the head is that we've been long people of the book. We love ideas. We love debates. Um, and many other people also are very committed to the life of the mind, but uh, it's been, it's a very special part of Jewish culture. Uh, 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 by Jewish heart, I was, the one thing I got out of uh, Temple B'nai Yehuda in Kansas City uh, was they <coughs> underscored constantly what now is often described as tikkun olam, that you have an individual responsibility to help try to make the world better, not just the Jewish world, but the world generally. And I think I've internalized that to some degree, and I, uh, it's very important to me. And the heritage, what's been thrilling for me in terms of working on the book, was learning so much more about our heritage, because it's, it's an extraordinary story. And uh, what I, and including the story of Jews in America, it's a fabulous story. And I feel that, in fact, uh, we uh, don't know enough. But part of, part of what I wonder, I mean, this is, a, perhaps shows how heretical I am, but uh, uh, all of our grandchildren had bar bat mitzvahs, which was fantastic. I'm glad they did. But <clears throat> the amount of energy that's put in to helping young people learn 
to phonetically read Hebrew, which they can't translate. I mean, part of me thinks, why aren't they being taught modern Hebrew so at least they could, with Israeli friends, they could speak <laughs> the same language? I mean, I'm just not sure. And I, I do get it because, in fact, to, to Dale and I, a problem we have because we grew up in the high water mark of classical reform, there are many reform congregations today where the service is predominantly in Hebrew. There's been a huge change in reform Judaism in that regard. And a change which for us doesn't, makes it harder, not easier. Uh, to relate because there's less English. But anyway, that's... Thank you. But we're each kind of product of our own times and how we, we, we grew up. And uh, that's a long-winded answer, but... It was perfect. And I think that is. you writing the book and entering into the conversation is evidence of your continued commitment. Well, see, so. part of what I feel, and I feel this very deeply, I think... For a Jew in America to take pride in being Jewish and to be publicly involved as a Jew, uh, and it really relates to one of the questions before, there are no costs. In our grandparents' generation, I mean, there were disadvantages to being a Jew. Yeah. It's not true anymore. And part of what I think is how well are we passing on uh, that pride, and well, anyway, so um, I, that's why I wanted to sort of at least encourage the conversation. Thank you for the question. So my, my question is, you know, Judaism is a religion, but it's also an ethnicity. Yes. And I don't think we fully understand the dimensions of that. And I was shocked when I did a DNA test from National Geographic. Yes where I was only identified as a number, to have them say, you carry three of the four lines of genes associated with the matriarchs of the Ashkenazi Jews. I don't think there's another religion that has that kind of genetic distinction. And I, I have no idea what it means. But it's shocking to me that these centuries of isolation and intermarriage have actually caused an evolutionary change. Well, to some degree, but 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 I'm uh, yeah. Well, intramarriage, I guess, is right. the correct term. But it it's done something to us biologically, and I don't think you can deny that. <laughs> I'll deny it. No, no. Let me tell you. Let me let me. T uh, I've I've written a chapter about this, which is entitled Jewish Blood. And the chapter begins with a story where I was at a lecture at a very fancy club in Boston, where a woman who'd written a uh, a, a history book about uh, Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill described the Jewish race. And she used the phrase Jewish race several times. And I felt it like a punch in the gut. So my students talk about um, uh, micro uh, aggressions. You know, and that is where there may be an unintentional something said, but it, it bothers you. And it did bother me. Um, and I, I, so I decided I really wanted to look into the history of the notion that Jews are a race. And of course, after the Holocaust, uh, the notion that we're a race is not so fashionable anymore because of course, not only was it true in 15th century Spain and 16th century Spain, where if you were a convert to Catholicism, for several generations, you still could not become a priest because of the taint of blood, and which was something that, I mean, essentially uh, Hitler picked up on. Um, I, I think it's a very dangerous notion. Now, what's interesting is just the point you make. The fashion of the day, there are probably 10 companies today, you pay them 100 bucks, and they'll tell you what your geographic origins are. And yet, and, and you can. I mean, I, I did mine. And I was 96% Ashkenazi, 4% other European. And I, I was sort of stunned. I was thinking, how many generations of endogamy, marrying in, did that represent? <coughs> a lot. A whole lot. Uh, but there is no Jewish gene. And in fact, the, the, it's all done correlationally. And it does relate to geographic areas. But I guess I think that it's... I, I'm not a big fan of it. The idea of a Jewish people, where it's not biological, but it's cultural, 
I find appealing, and I try to analyze that too. So I've got chapters on race, I've got chapters on peoplehood, I've got a chapter on the religion where I say, look, the obvious answer to the question of what you've got to do to be Jewish is maybe you've got to believe certain things and uh, be observant. I mean, uh, you can't be an Anglican, and I don't think, and, uh, or at least any kind of good Anglican, and not believe certain things. But Judaism doesn't have a catechism. And uh, Maimonides tried to create one, and it was kind of rejected. Uh, so it's, it's, we, we are a strange kind of, quote, religion that has this cultural dimension. I think that's true. Yes. Well, thank you for your uh, visiting us and for your talk. Uh, clearly, many of us are wrestling with uh, Jewish identity. And whereas I like, I very much like the idea of the big tent, um, big tents really do have only s so much room there. And I kind of think of the uh, Tevye paradigm, whereas, you know, there's so much that can be tolerated, it does get beyond a point when things aren't tolerated. Right. And the question that I have is that where do beliefs, entities such as Messianic Judaism and and Jews for Jesus fit within the Manukin standard? That's a perfectly fair question. And it's a question that I, I, uh, uh, I struggle with. Uh, uh, I talk in the book about the Brother Daniel case. Uh, Brother Daniel was a Polish, someone born in Poland, a Jew, who was actually quite heroic during the Holocaust, but he also ended up converting to Catholicism uh, became a priest and wanted to um, <clears throat> emigrate to Israel under the law of return. And he claimed that he was both a Catholic and a Jew. Now, theologically, obviously, I understand that there's a contradiction in that uh, in terms of whether uh, uh, Jesus is the Savior or not. Uh, anyway, it's a really very interesting case, but my own view is um, uh, it, do, it doesn't bother me so much. I mean, I, you know, by the way, in Israel today, well, a uh, uh, couple anecdotes. This is little known. The first 10 years of Israel's existence, you know what the test under the law of return was on whether you were Jewish? No. Whether you said you were. <laughs> and indeed... The Ministry of Interior, all hell broke loose after they issued, issued a regulation saying, do not investigate. If someone's willing to commit to the enterprise, welcome them. Now, ultimately, that's all been turned on its head uh, in, in Israel. Uh, but I find that uh, interesting. And, I, you know, I, I think uh, th there obviously can be What's complicated about identity is apart from how you think of yourselves, uh, if you're part of a group, it's also relevant how other people may think of you too. And I don't want to deny that. Um, and and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, I think for me, at least for the big tent, self-identification is good enough. Thanks. Question for you, Bob. Um, in various points today in your presentation and in the book, you do say, you do contrast some of the theses with the Orthodox. Yes. Now, what about the Orthodox? They would say, as I understand it, you're making it too easy. You're making it too easy. There are obligations that go with being Jewish and following Jewish heritage and Jewish law. And we, Chabad, Hasidim, Rabbi Schneerson's followers, they would say, we don't have a crisis here. We're growing by leaps and bounds, to tell you the truth, with members. And how do you equate the pushback from certain, uh, and they say one other point. Even if we don't, even if the growth slows down, our attempt to influence this debate and not give up so quickly the heritage and the ritual and the requirements. Um, we think we're really heroes here, actually. And we will continue to do our best to influence the debate and try and get even more people to join 
this situation? How do you respond to all of that? Godspeed. No, really. In America, you have every right to. I deeply believe that, uh, you know, in, in religious freedom. And uh, uh, we'll see. I, I'm, I can't prognosticate the future. Well, but uh, you are saying that it's unlikely if things continue the way they are, without the open tent, um, will be more and more diminished and diluted. Well, you know, look, I remain really quite optimistic. And, and you know, uh, 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 there's a demographic issue, and that is uh, Orthodox Jews have more children. Mm -hmm. uh, and other Jews have fewer children, have them later, uh, so, you know, it's not as if the numbers are going to remain static. I don't think they are. But I guess what I care a lot about and what worries me the most, you know, my colleague Alan Dershowitz wrote a book about the Amer vanishing American Jew. I think that's bullshit. Forgive my French. American Jews aren't going to vanish. What I worry about is in 30 years are the only people who are identifying as Jewish, the most fervent Zionists who are living in America, uh, and... Uh, the Orthodox. And uh, th th they both are going to still be around, in my view. And what my feeling, my, I would have a feeling of regret because I think the contribution to American life and Jewish life of the others has been enormous. And I, uh, where, where, uh, uh, by people who take pride in their identification of Jews but may not be religiously observant. Thank you. Um, two, two comments. One is um, I like your idea of the Big Tent because I've been reading more and more essays recently about kind of the divide between Israel and American Jewry and that we view Jew Judaism as a religion. Mm -hmm. Israelis view Judaism more as a nationality and we're just right. operating in different silos right. and how you view Judaism now. And you're, you're approaching this, I think, f from many of us in our generation looking down the generations and right now for example my daughter's involved in a project in new york between the threads six jewish women in their 20s exploring their identity and their stories of where they are and how they're coming to grips with their jewish identity and what it means to them is so so diverse and intriguing that it's already reflecting a lot of what you're writing well i i think there are really very exciting things going on within the Jewish world, some religious, some not religious. Mm -hmm. um, so as I say, I, I remain, uh, I, I'm optimistic. Uh, um, and uh, we'll, I hope to be around long enough to see how some of it's gonna turn out, but uh, I, th th what that enterprise you're describing sounds very interesting indeed. Hi. Hi. So when I was growing up, my parents told me that intermarriage did what Hitler couldn't. Prohibited. No, killing all the Jews. Intermarriage is killing Intermarriage all the Jews. Intermarriage was doing what Hitler couldn't do. Hitler tried to kill all the Jews. Intermarriage is doing that. So you know I married someone non-Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Had to be. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my mother said to me all the things that Jewish mothers would say, you know, a fish and a bird can marry, but where will they make a nest? All of those things were very, very poignant. But for an agnostic, right, who considers themselves Jewish, to marry an atheist who doesn't consider themselves Catholic, I was like, eh, we can figure it out. Right? But it's hard. It is hard. It's very hard. It's hard to, when you have no definitive, right? Yeah. When there's so many things that are gray. So my son said to me, tell me the story of Passover, Mommy. And I told him the entire story of Passover. And then he looked at me with his very, very smart six-year-old eyes and said, is it true? <laughs> And I said, 
there are things that there are stories that we tell from generation to generation not because they are true that's not the most important thing it's that they teach us something about who we are mm -hmm. so you you try to be as smart as you possibly can because you're dancing very very quickly um, but it is a dance and it's hard because as much as I married outside of my religion I want my children can, to consider themselves Jewish, and that's very difficult. Well, um, good for you that you want that, and it sounds like your spouse is probably in no sense opposing it. Maybe, I don't know. I don't no, know what, no, not, not opposing uh, it, but, but not it, encouraging it either. No, look, I'll, I'll tell you, though, I mean, what, what is uh, certainly true is that in terms of negotiation, uh, couples with differences of all sorts have to learn how to negotiate. Um, and and that, that can be as true, you know, to a substantial degree, if two Jews marry. Uh, and there are, the, maybe more, maybe more, maybe more. Uh, uh, but, I, but I think that, I, I, I think that in fact, what happens when you're raising children is you realize things are more important to you than you had ever thought they were. Yeah. And can you talk about it? And there may be a temptation to avoid. I talk a little bit about this in the book because I'm interested in conflict resolution. But you're right, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Absolutely right. I guess we've done it. Thank you.